jump in to some material. So today's lecture really builds on some of the material presented last time and, and actually previous sessions in the sense that it, it links in to this issue of software quality, software quality assurance, testability, enablement of testing. Um, Lucas, did you have your- Yeah, I'm really excited. I have no idea where it's going because I just never actually- There's two links. Um, if you go into the- Canvas. Um, into Canvas. Yes. We have the one link, and then there's a reply to the about the other link. I'm not sure which one's currently working. Oh gosh. Okay. But I sent it. I sent it to my Discord people, like that are on our team because they are on the other link. Okay. Yeah. So, um, uh, mumble. Um, I can send it to you on chat, but that doesn't exactly work. Uh. Um, mumble. Yeah. So uh, see if you can find that. You got it. Okay. Awesome. Awesome. Okay. Um, okay. Again, really appreciate that. Um, so, uh, and I see there's a chat. Okay. Well, I'm smiling back. You might not see it except through the mask. Thanks. Um, okay. So um, today's going to be on contracts, code contracts and specifications. What's, when I say a code contract, what am I talking about, anyone? What am I speaking of when I speak about code contracts? What's a contract involving code? Yeah, Lee. Uh, can you like a document that describes like what the code is supposed to do and like the preconditions that you need? Yeah. Uh, like the yeah, it's, it's really, specification, a characterization of what the code is expected to do um, and the conditions under which that behavior is expected. Now, the form of these code contracts is different for different sorts of sets of code. It turns out it'll be different if you're talking about a function or method on the one hand versus say a whole class versus a whole system as a whole, where you have issues with quality of service and availability and reliability and security, et cetera. Today, I'm gonna to be concentrating on this issue kind of in the small, so the area of, of, of methods and, and uh, functions, okay? And we're gonna be talking about this as, as really quite essential um, in the software development process to think about taking advantage of, of using these contracts to, to build understanding of what uh, each piece of the system has to do, separate from the issue of how it does it. And that's the distinction I'm making. You can characterize often very crisply in very brief terms what something is supposed to do, even if how it does it is much more complex. Give me an example where there's a real difference between the complexity of implementing something, how it has to be done. You might write quite a bit of code versus what it accomplishes. Anyone? Can you give me an example? Okay, if, if you don't, I will. Um, think about a square root function, right? We call a square root on a double precision value. What we get back is a number such that if we square it, in other words, we multiply it by itself, we get back the original number we gave. So we say, take the square root of two. And whatever we get back, we know if we multiply it by itself, we get two, right? Or take the square root of seven. Whatever number we get back, if we multiply it by itself, we should get seven, okay? Crisp property easy to state. Now, writing the code to do it is not a trivial undertaking, right? Um, and writing to do it and handle error conditions, like what happens if you give it a negative number, et cetera. Um, uh, that takes a lot more thought, but the specification is pretty crisp um, of generally what it is 
supposed to accomplish. And the same thing is true for a lot of those algorithms. How many people are in or have taken C of G360, the algorithms class? Yeah, okay. So in that class, you may be exploring many particular algorithms, uh, algorithms for sorting, perhaps, algorithms for searching, algorithms for figuring out the flow through a network, um, you know, algorithms for determining the smallest value in some set, et cetera. And there's all sorts of data structures and, and algorithms for achieving this, but often what they accomplish can be boiled down into a pretty crisp sort of statement about what this does. How they differ, of course, is efficiency and perhaps the conditions under which they apply, for example, radix sort versus merge sort versus quick sort, et cetera. The, the guarantees about them. So, you know, often there's a big difference in how challenging it is to characterize what something accomplishes versus how. Almost always there is, except in very trivial cases where the how is almost falls out of the wall. Okay, so we're going to be talking about using this what, specifying the what, the, the specification, and how it helps along many lines. So let's let's dive into why it helps. Can anyone anticipate my comments? Why would characterizing what something does be beneficial in software development? I see Larissa's hand is up without even casting an eye in that direction. So Larissa, yes. It helps with testing, like mm -hmm. platform tests, rather than doing your tweaks because you make sure that the actual results are what you need. Totally, totally, and. You don't have to go and look at the code, right? You, you just call it and, and you see if uh, it does what's expected to do. So, so it's great for testing. Who is it? Where does it also help beyond testing? Anyone? Lee, yes. Um, collaboration to help the developer know what code to do. Exactly. So it'll help the developers know what. If I wrote this code, they don't have to wade through all the details of the code. They can look at the specification and say, okay, I understand basically what its, what its job is, right? What it guarantees. And critically, I, I kind of glossed over it, but under what conditions it will do that. For example, maybe square root, the specification says there, gives, you know, returns a number, Given a number, it will return a number such that square of that return value is equal to the number provided to the function, to the argument. But maybe it rules out a negative number, for example. All right, it says like the number provided must be greater than or equal to zero. In which case, you know, then someone else knows how to call it the legal conditions under which you will call it, right? All right. Or maybe there's a function strlen, which determines the length of a string, but it says you have to call it with a non-null argument, right? And so you know, okay, I gotta be really careful. I can't provide a null value to this, but if the value is points to a legitimate string, um, it will return the length of that string. Hmm? Yeah. So so a specification helps other developers and it helps them also divide up the work because you know it allows one person to focus on their work and not get all mucked up with others and in fact it allows one person to start writing code against other people's work what do i mean by saying writing code against it meaning I'm writing code that uses their work or what will be their work even before they've written it because I have the specifications. I, I have a characterization of what it needs to do its job and what its job is for each of their functions they're gonna be working on. And maybe they haven't implemented them all yet, but I, count, I can count on enough of what they're gonna do to start my work. Yeah, so it helps division of, of labor. What else could it help with? Anyone else? What else? What other things could it help with? Testing, division of labor, clarity in terms of uh, you know one person understanding another person's code. What what else could it help with? 
Another important kind of technical contributions or, or processes. Well, peer review can help because you kind of understand what's expected in the code and you see if this code, how it does it, in fact, matches up against the what. So that's good. Another thing it can help with is mocking because it gives you the basis to mock. Another thing it can do is help with assertions, writing assertions, because it's like a freebie for assertions. Why do I say it's a freebie for assertions? Why is that? Yes, Larissa, you're on a roll. Speak on. Yes. Totally, totally. So you could, and, there, and there's some differences in philosophy with this, but you know, one really good option that lots of software does is basically you assert at the beginning of the code, if you say, look, I'm counting on this being the case, this being the case, this argument being non-null, this data structure having no duplicates, you know, this other string value being non, not just an empty string or being an all uppercase, I can assert those things are true. And then the code can count from them being true with, with absolute confidence. Those assertions there would typically be removed at runtime. In other words, they won't make it into shipping code because you don't want, you know, every, every time someone's running the code necessarily be running them. Um, again, there's differences in philosophy about this, but, but the point is it, it provides you know, sort of an obvious set of things to check. The post conditions, which are part of the specification too, saying, what does this code guarantee? You know, given a non-null string, I will count the number of characters in it. Um, I could in fact, you know, confirm uh, in an assertion, for example, that the return value the return value for this string is always greater than or equal to zero or something like that. I mean, that would, that would be a very weak property. If I counted the number of distinct characters in the string, certainly the number of distinct characters in the string should not be greater than the length of the string. So I could check that. There's many things I could check that would at least give me a sanity check that this return value is, is plausibly correct without redoing the work. So they can be a freebie for assertions, like just let the assertions flow out. Good. Well, th there's lots of good reasons for these. And it turns out um, they provide a key element of achieving what's called abstraction, um, hiding of details. Okay. So this feeds directly into testability um, under the specification today. Okay. Um, or specifying what, what code does uh, rather than all the details of how, and, and at some point we'll fill in, of course, the how, okay? And the, the problem, one of the problems here is that, look, code is complex, we have big systems. And when you have lots of people on a team, as you do here, working on a software project, you know, you may know a lot, but there's a lot you don't know about the system, the rest of the system. And even what you know, sometimes you forget and your memory is vague about this because you wrote the code so long ago. And the problem is these days, you know, we built up really, really large code bases, millions of lines for many commercial packages of code. And, you know, this um, makes it hard for any one person to keep all but a small piece of it in their, in, in their head. Um, and modularity lets us break this up. And we try to break it up according to this principle of separation of concerns. Anyone, can anyone say, what do I mean by separation? I talk about applying the principle of separation of concerns to a software project. Anyone? You may have heard this in 270, conceivably 370. Well, we talked about the big piece of software. It's key for manageability and extensibility and being able to break it up so that different people can work on it and testability and understandability and uh, ability to 
to evolve the code that a large system not be implemented in one giant parable, but instead make use of many, many different pieces. So I'm drawing the arrows one way, but you know they could be drawn many ways. And I should I should really to avoid a disservice to our remote attendees, I should at least make a, a passable effort about trying to sort of incorporate and understand of what's on the board here. Okay, so we have a system and you know each of these components may use others and there may actually be a network of dependencies here, etc. But a large system is composed of many pieces and the point is with separation of concerns, you kind of divide up different types of concerns like UI related stuff, database related stuff, issues having to do with the business logic, the kind of core logic of what are the rules of your business into different areas of this system. You know, the things that deal with the core algorithms are clustered together, the things that deal with user input kind of go together, the things that deal with underlying hardware, maybe the GPU are kind of in a separate area and carved off into their own modules. This is the notion of separation of concerns. And it allows different sets of people with different specialties to work on them. So maybe the folks who understand hardware really well are working this hardware layer. Others deal with high level UI, you know, UX issues with user experience. Someone deal with the user experience side. And user and languages for that. And the folks working on the database layer are, you know, really expert on Oracle, Oracle query optimizations and so on. So you divide up this work. Um, and this allows also different areas of the system to evolve separately. So modularity allows this divide and conquer, and it allows for sort of evolution in the system in a way that's that's neat. And this supports also testability and and debugging separately across each area of the system and review and specialization of people on the on the staff for different types of skill sets okay now a key for this modularity to achieve this modularity is this notion of abstraction now, abstraction is a term you hear a lot about in computer science can anyone give me a sense of what abstraction the term abstraction means. But when we talk about software, we're talking about abstraction software. Yeah, Lee. Yeah, it's just um, taking away the detail. Right. That is a key definition. And I remember back to 1990, where I was dealing with one of the one of the people who was most active in and advancing this term, Joel Moses, who had been the head of MIT's EECS department. I was in an elevator with him. He was talking to someone else about abstraction. And he said, look, the essence of abstraction is hiding details. Really, really, that's how he views it. And I've remembered that ever since. It's been 30 years now. But that elevator pitch <laughs> stuck in my mind, even though it wasn't directed at me. Um, Look, abstraction is, is about hiding details that are inessential. It's about hiding details that don't matter for a particular take, okay? Um, and this allows us to achieve a lot of benefits. It allows other people working in the system, different areas of it, to not worry about the details here. It allows them to deal with sort of higher level issues that are more manageable rather than knowing all about the details of this. Um, it also allows for us to evolve this code without it breaking the rest of the system. Because if the rest of the system depended on these details, all the intricacies of you know exactly what sort algorithm it used, then if you change the sort algorithm from bubble sort to quick sort, or from merge sort to radix sort, you break everything else in the program. We have software that's interconnected, but we don't want it to be brittle, fragile, so that if you modify one component, it kind of throws off everything, right? As another professor of mine commented, look, 
Um, this is this is the mid '90s at the start of the internet, um, and now mind you, we had had at MIT they had had ARPANET for decades by then, and I was an avid user of it. But this is the start of like the public internet as we know it. This um, uh, Netscape and Netscape Communicator and the first generation of browsers. I remember it well. 1993, my first browser experience. And um, at that time, you know, there was um, this great elation about, look, we're going to be able to interconnect the world, interconnect every, all the computers in the world. And that sounds great, except if interconnection means brittleness, right? Like, it means an error like me plug, unplugging my computer from the internet or a power failure over here crashes computers across the world. That isn't very encouraging, right? Interconnection shouldn't mean interbreaking or something, right? Um, brittleness. We need we need to build it up in a way that's flexible. And one way of achieving this, believe it or not, is flexibility by putting aside certain details. Abstraction allows flexibility by preventing these folks from needing to know about these details. You're also allowing this to evolve independently. Okay. Now there's really two ways that uh that you can achieve um abstraction and this is from gosh do i have a cross this one uh this barbara liskov and john gutek um they characterize look abstraction by parameterization where basically we we reuse the same piece of code with different detailed values specified to it do it with this assumption or do it with that assumption about these values it's like doing square root instead of having a different square root function for each possible number you have one square root function you just specify the number do it for square root of two do it for square root of seven you just pass a different number that's kind of parameterization the other is specification uh, abstraction by specification that's what we're going to be talking about here okay um okay so um abstraction by parameterization is really familiar from your very first courses in computer science, right? You, you learned, look, um, you, could, you could create an, an add function, which takes two arguments and adds them together, right? And JavaScript, it, it takes, maybe it's two arguments, uh, strings, and it add, interprets them as ints, and it returns an int, or something like that. Of course, JavaScript is dynamically typed, so you don't say actual int. But the point is that you have a function that can handle different arguments. Uh, same thing with square root, as we said. Or maybe instead of having the count of male and count of female, you have count population by some sex you specify. You could give it a say, I want to count the number of males, it'll do that. Or I want to count the number of females, it'll do that. Great. And there's many versions of this parameterization. Some more advanced classes you'll hear about type parameterization anyone at 340 here right now or will be at 340 is it being taught right now it is okay. awesome <laughs> that is a great course the ta haskell haskell now haskell forever what's that and scala. Oh, scala this year yeah great <laughs> well scala is also a favorite language i, I uh, taught it before it was taught at 340 i taught scala in 470. Um, and Scala is a great language. I love it. Um, okay, I'd love to have a discussion about that. Uh, there's some trade offs with Haskell, but Haskell and Scala are both fantastic languages. And both of them support type parameterization um, in really rich ways. You can, you can take like a list, and instead of being, you know, instead of specifying, having to specify like a list of ends separately from a list of rules, you could just have one list, right? Um, and list, you have a type parameter saying, I want a list of ends here. I want a list of rules. That's very powerful. So we have this abstraction by parameterization. So, you know, suppose we have some code, we have foo and we have bar. So maybe, maybe this is foo. And maybe this is bar. And instead of each of them implementing a sort routine, maybe a bubble sort, right? Um, we 
we instead sort of we, well, that's brittle because if we update it here to fix a bug, we might forget to do it here, right? It's a code chloroform, needlessly duplicating code, and it leaves room for luck, for risk of errors uh, being duplicated. So instead, you want to consolidate, right? You have both of these use a common implementation of sort. Maybe initially it's a Called bubble sort, right? And this would be by parameterization. And each of them just call it with a different array. This one, foo, is dealing with an array of prices that, that it needs to sort, and var is dealing with an array of ages that it needs to sort. Both of them can call off to this, just pass the array they want to deal with, and some way of comparing it. And this will return a sorted array, and they'll both be happy and go off and, and do great things. Great. Um, the problem is that, so this is abstraction by parameterization. They are, we're handling these two different details by just passing it as an argument. These differ only in the detail of which array they're dealing with. And we kind of carve that out to be a parameter here, a parameter for this. And we just pass it. So this one says do it on price. This one does it on ages, but but this deals with the general need to sort, right? And the details are abstracted out into these little, this, this argument that's passed through. This is what we call abstraction by parameterization. It should be pretty familiar to you, although this is probably a more advanced version than you would have gotten into in your first year. Versions of this occurred even in first year. You know. Find the number of X within some code, the number of occurrences of this string or that string. The problem is that, look, um, maybe the person who maintains this code is different than the ones here. Maybe this code is secretly counting on ties to be resolved in a certain way. So if, if you have two arguments or two values here that are uh, the same price, maybe it's trying to make sure you're, you're trying to um, provide a guarantee that the ordering of them won't be reversed or something. And, and there are cases where that might be violated. And the problem is that this might not guarantee that, or maybe it'll be changed to a quick sort where that's not the case. So maybe originally when this was a bubble sort, it was all fine and good, but when it's changed to a quick sort, what these two pieces of code are counting on something breaks. And now what's going on over here has broken what's going on here. Um, that's a problem. That's a problem. We don't want a nice you know, division of labor to lead to brittleness, right? We don't want it to lead to what I do crashes everything you folks do. I hose all of you because I, I changed one line in my code or something like that, or because I optimized my algorithm and suddenly your code breaks. That, as Shakespeare said in King Lear, that way lies madness. The king, the king Lear, it's a line. Um, okay, so the problem is that, you know, this, this, if this is the case, um, we're, we're eliminating a lot of benefits. Foo and Bar need to know all the details about this. And they don't want to know the details about this. They've got enough issues to deal with just in their own neck of the woods. They don't have to go look at the details of this. So the way we deal with this is this abstraction by specification. Okay. And we're going to go through an exercise of this with you in just a few minutes here. Where you're going to try to build up a specification for a couple of things. Okay. Okay. So the idea is look, and you folks will have heard this. You will have heard it in 270. You will have heard it in 370. And you will hear it again. In <laughs> 371. Okay. I, I didn't want to crash your heart. So, um. Okay, so uh, the idea is to separate interface from implementation. 
Where did you hear that from four? 270. No, no, say something more. Did you hear that in one of those classes in conjunction with something? So, yeah, model view of control, you would have heard about it. So you have a separate, separate interface, like a programming interface, separate from the underlying implementation that allows you to swap out a different controller, for example, or a different view. So you can have this visualization or that visualization or what have you, right? You could have it rendered as text. You could have it rendered as vector graphics or whatever. Okay. Um, where else have you heard it? Hopefully in object-oriented programming, you've heard it. So you have an interface. There's a class which implements that interface. There might be many classes which implement that interface. And you can pass an instance of those classes, any of those classes around as if it's just something which implements that interface and it can be called through that. So here we separate the interface from the details of the implementation, okay? The details are hidden here. Um, and what's hidden is the, the differences between implementations, okay? Um, they're different, but they make use of the same interface. Everyone's happy. There's this interface that says, you know, this is what I do. In short, it specifies a contract, okay? Um, and uh, there's a lot of benefits for this. Locality. So basically, I can build my piece without worry about how everything it's going to call off to is it um, I know enough about your code, just enough about your code for me to do my job and to know my code won't break when you change yours. But I don't have to know all the gobs of details. Um, and that allows me to, to focus on my work. Um, there's some reuse opportunities. You can actually have many things go through the same interface to, um, so in other words, if you have code that operates on a fruit in general, it can work with an apple and it can work with an orange or with a banana. And uh, that example is probably pretty stale from 270 or 370. But the point is there's a whole you know, set of different things, a whole class of different things that, that we can write code against code that operates on any of those things. We don't have to rewrite it to operate on the apple, separately a banana, and separately an orange, and perhaps even a palmella, okay? Um, okay, yes, so um, subject to my specification is, is really handy. It allows us to kind of separate out um, the details of implementation from what other people are counting on. They're all counting on an, an interface. And the question is, how do we define this interface? And the problem is, if you're just counting on the, the names of the methods, the names of the functions and their types, you're gonna be specifying way too little information. Hmm? way too little information for you to do your job. Um, instead, we need to provide something more than that. The, the types just don't cut it in terms of providing enough specifics on what we can count on and what is required by that code. And so we use what are called specifications to provide guarantees for the interface. And generally these are human written, okay? Um, so the question is, how do we make this code, for example, less brittle? So, you know, an assumption here that tacit won't be broken by this code. Well, what we do is we write a specification. We have specification for this code, the sort code here, which is specified by more than just this. Yeah, you, know, you give me a array of values and I'll give you back a pointer to the ordering of the elements. Um, Instead, you have something like, okay, look, given an array of values, I return an array consisting of the permuted indices of the elements, with the ordering being such that the elements in those are arranged in the ascending order. 
Okay. Um, okay, this is kind of a mouthful, but what I'm saying is that it's returning uh, an array that is each of whose element is an index in the original array, where if you consider those indices in turn, um, and whatever array that was passed to it, um, they'll be in, in uh, non-decreasing order. They'll go from small to, to higher, okay? And the, there's a precondition that the values passed are not null. And the post condition uh, basically says, where did it, where did it uh, originate? Now you could study this to understand what's better meant here. But the point is we could specify like ties, values with equal value retain their original order. And that allows someone who's using this code to know, look, my code can count on that with confidence. I know it won't break. Whatever, however this evolves, whatever sorting algorithm they use, I know it's not gonna break my code because my code does count on them retaining their order. And that's part of the specification. It's part of a guarantee. A specification provides a guarantee to users. So the specification for this code down here would provide a guarantee that what foo can count on being the case and what bar can count from being the case and tells them what I'm counting on from, from you, from foo or from bar. Okay, it says, if you give me such and such, I will do this guaranteed job for you and you can take it to the bank, count on it from now forward. Okay, this is the idea. Um, so contracts de define this agreement between implementation and usage, and they're described by specifications, okay? Um, and they can be provided at different levels. I won't get into this today, but if you start getting into distributed computing, worldwide distributed computing and microservices more seriously, and you start getting into understanding sort of networks of services, you realize there's actually specifications that can be provided, not only to sort of contracts of precondition, post conditions, and we'll probably see on this class invariance and history properties for classes, but also, performance contracts like how quickly it will what when is how how quickly is it guaranteed to return for a given argument or quality of service guarantees for uptime etc okay so a lot of the challenge from writing good specifications is to write them in a way that balances between too little information and too much you want it to be detailed enough that the users of it can count on useful functionality and that they and that can rule out certain implementations that don't meet your needs okay um but you want it still general enough to not pin you down fully so that you have the flexibility to change the implementation to like optimize this code for example change your sort routine that you I want the ability to, to change it without breaking their code. So maybe I'll provide a guarantee like ties are retained in the same order, but otherwise I'm not going to provide any statement about what, what algorithm I use. So you need to balance between these two. Too much information in my hands as an implementer of this code are tied. Too little information Who's going to use me compared to some other sort of routine provided by a third party because they're not going to be able to know that certain things are guaranteed that they want to come from. So I need to have this sort of balance about how much info I provide. And, you know, if I provide way too little, like just my argument type and my return type, People may count inadvertently on things which no longer are the case, and I'll break their code. That's that's part of the risk. Too little information people may count on. Okay, now here's the thing. I want to get into to uh, a few examples for you to come. Oh my gosh, it got mangled. Well, mangled exam, mangled examples for you to work on are better than no examples at all. Okay, um, so. 
some benefits of this. There's, there's benefits to two parties, to the users of the abstraction. So here's the abstraction, right? This is the abstraction. Okay, that we're providing. We're providing this. And the question is to whom, by having a specification associated with this, this is our specification for this abstraction. What's the benefit? Well, it accrues to two parties. Number one, the creators of this abstraction. Okay. Um, so basically, um, okay, right. Um, so they have a, a clear understanding of what can be freely modified with this. Um, they understand what properties it has to guarantee, so they can write tests against it even before it's written, right? Um, they understand what they can change and what they can't change here, what things their hands are tied on because they've guaranteed them, like they can't have ties, you know, change order um, and values. Uh, and uh, by extension, they know what features users might be counting on. So what features, if they change them, will break user code, okay? Um, okay, so the creators of the abstraction have a, um, a real benefit that comes. They can modify this code within limits, within constraints, confident won't break the code for lots of other people that are counting on it. But the people that use it, like Foo and Bar here that use this abstraction, use this sorting routine, let's say. The, the fact that we have this specification provides guarantees on which they can count. Foo knows, look, whatever evolves in this, you know, I know I will be continue to guarantee that ties will be retained in the same order and that it will return to sorted array. Great. So they're they're sure of that. And they can let the implementer of the abstraction, you know, evolve it as they see fit. Um, by exception, it, it also means there are things they can't count. If they don't see it in the specification, they shouldn't be counting on it. If it doesn't say, for example, that the results are guaranteed to occur in you know, n log n time or something along those lines. Um, they know they, they they shouldn't be counting on that. Uh, and they have no need to look through the code base, read it, or even to access this code base. This could be a opaque object provided in binary form like the Java libraries that they can't see. Okay. So specifications, specifications. The availability of them for this abstraction provides this ability for both parties, the creators of this abstraction and these parties to each operate separately without worry that what's going on here will arbitrarily break things here. And it allows testing to start for this, right? Tests can be written against this early because they know what properties they need to test from the abstraction. From this and through this specification. And they can write assertions using those. Uh, and the developers of this are clearer about what, what features they're talking about. Okay, so let's let's talk about this for some examples. And I, I don't understand what what has happened here. I've, I've seen it several times now, and it's uh distressing. Um okay, so I want you to to, to riddle me this, um, suppose that we have a function. This is, this is for a bit of thinking right now in class. And I'll, I'll give each of this a bit of time for the same thing. So suppose you have a function find first. I've deliberately written these in a kind of vague way because I'm going to ask you for each of these to specify to suggest some elements of what you might specify for this. I'm not asking you to write a full specification. That might come in a separate time, a pop quiz or an exam. It might come in a, in a longer take-home exercise. But right now I'm gonna ask you for each of these, what are some 
elements you might think are important to write for a specification of each of these functions. Okay, the first function, each of these is to be considered separately. There's three of them here. The first is find first. And find first is a function whose job in life is to find the first occurrence of some string, str being found, within some other string, str find in. Okay, so we're looking for the second argument within the first argument as strings. So each of these is a string. And we want to return the location of the first occurrence of this str being found within str find in. What might be some things that a specification would say, either as preconditions or, or post conditions? That that you want to specify. Anyone? Yes, Larissa. Uh, Good. Yeah. So in some languages that might not be guaranteed, right? Um, these might be with you just a sec. Um, so these might be passed in as numerical values or something, and that's whacked out. Uh, so uh, getting a bunch of hands up, which is awesome. And I love Larissa's suggestion. So that's one thing. Uh, in the back there, is it? Josh. Josh, yes. Okay, so yeah. Yeah, so whatever this code does, it shouldn't stomp on these strings, right? Like it shouldn't change them. So these should remain invariant, meaning they, they, they won't evolve, they won't change during this code. They're left untouched. They're left. Unmodified. Uh, I saw another uh, hand up. Was it Renton? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, string finding can't be empty. Okay. String finding can't be empty. If this is empty, that might not make a lot of sense. How do you find something in an empty string? All right. Um, that, that's, it could be arguable, but it's a perfectly reasonable thing to say that, like, Look, I mean, look, what are you doing if you're passing an empty string to this, right? Um, that's, it's not, maybe you view it as not really well defined. So amongst other things, there's no way you're gonna find it, right? <laughs> uh, what, unless this is empty, in which case then you've got to say, do you, can you find an empty string and an empty string? So you could rule that out and that would be perfectly reasonable. Um, yes. And, um, okay. uh, yeah. Okay, so suppose you don't find screw being found within screw find in. What are you going to return? Right? Um, okay, so that's that's really an important question. Um, are you going to return negative one? Are you going to return minus 99? Are you going to return min int, the minimum possible integer? Um, these are really important questions, right? Or are you, as part of the specification, requiring as a precondition that if one of these, in fact, does, is guaranteed to exist in that, which would be a different, you know, it would be a more restrictive condition, right? Be more restrictive condition and it might be onerous to some users of it. They might say, I don't want to use this, I want to use some other library because this is too restrictive. So that's a very good, good excellent one. And I need more people thinking like that. Anything else? Okay, so so these are all pretty good things. You might, you know, in a language which can have null pointers, you might assume that either of these is null. Right. If if either of these is null, that's like what are you what are you supposed to do? Right. Um, someone's handing you almost bad data, so you might, as a precondition, say neither of these can, can be called with a null. Alternatively, you could say, look, if either of these is null, I will return a value indicating you can't find it, but that would almost be hiding an error potentially. So you want to be careful about that balance, right? You don't want to just say, you know, I'm going to handle any old garbage by just being silent about it. That's not necessarily helping system quality. 
Uh, yes, yeah, Shanti, did you have your hand up? Yeah. Also, like we can add some try catch blocks. Uh -huh. Check like if something is like like these things are empty or like what kind of things are there. Okay. And based upon those try catch, we can like throw like some custom exceptions. Okay. Yeah. So you could might have an exception specification here that goes beyond returning an int, right? Um, so good. Like now you you want to be careful with exceptions. So it's a good idea. Um, the thing you have to watch out for about exceptions, there's a big thing that often they don't tell you about exceptions in your introductory Java class. Anyone know what it is? Exceptions are really expensive. It turns out that they have to do fancy things on the stack because if there are an exception, you have to pop off the stacks until you get back to an exception handler, which could be several levels up. And it has to do some funky stuff along the way, like free up memory that was that was allocated or what have you. And there's 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 kind of a lot of complexity about maintaining that whole infrastructure. So so using exceptions is definitely advised in some cases. It's a lot better than returning just some old error value for really big errors. But if you're throwing them a lot, it actually can really slow your system down. If you're throwing them in, turn, in, in an inner loop, like very frequently, your system may be many times slow um, because of the overhead of exceptions. These are, these are understood issues among Java developers. Um, okay. So this is, uh, anyone else with this first one? Okay, I've kind of put these in a list of subtlety or texture. How about the second one? Count substring occurrence. A little bit of similar flavor. Each of them has a tiny bit of overlap with previous ones, but count substring occurrence. Okay, here we have a string being, uh, found in a string find and we, we want to find how many instances are there of stir of, of stir being found within stir find in I'm not sure whether they're in opposite order but, um, what so we're trying to find how many of these are there within this okay so what sort of things might you look for in a, in providing in a specification Yes. So one thing I like, can be like used for the first one and the first example. Good. Uh, that is string length. So if we are sending like a, like a string to be found that's longer than string input, okay. then you won't be able to find it. Okay. So possibly you want to you want to be restrictive there. Although again, you have to be careful because someone could say, "Look, I just want to be able to call this with anything." And, you know, I could pass it. You know, a longer word, if trying to look for it in a shorter word, but it just it should return zero, right? Um, it's not an error. And so this this again is is a matter of judgment. It's a matter of look, um, if 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 being restrictive would really help you implement this in an efficient way, you know, as its implementer, right? And when you're implementing this guy down here, you're the implementer of this abstraction. If it would help you you know, put in a rip snorting fast implementation to be able to impose a constraint uh, or not have to worry about a huge number of things. Maybe you want to do that. But if you have to realize that constraints that are put in like on preconditions might might put off some of the users, it might be off putting it might 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 be that they feel this is overly restrictive. They want to be able to call this thing with different strings. And, you need to think about that. I, I I agree. Or suppose string being found is empty, right? What does it mean? And this applies to the first one. People did people mention the reverse. Suppose string find in is empty, but how does string being found is empty? What does it mean to count the number of instances of an empty string and another string? Like, is that well defined? Maybe there you want to rule that out, right? What's another thing you might want to deal with here? A little bit subtle. Oh, substring. It sounds sounds so easy, right? Think about a kind of strange things that could happen. Uh, yes, Jeremy. I guess the final 
where it starts and ends. Like if you have a string of all x's, then you're looking for two x's where they start and end. Exactly. Good. So if you have a string of maybe the string find in is you know SSS, something like that. And you're finding the string SS. How many instances of that string are in SSS? Or you're finding a string AA and AAA. Is it one? Is it two? Um, the argument for one is well, okay, you find the first AA, but you're not going to find another one except overlapped with it, right? You've already used up those two A's or something like that. So someone might say it should only be one by by all you know by all reasonable measure. But someone else might say, well, wait a wait a minute, you know, there's there's an AA at the beginning and there's an AA at the end. Um, you know. AAA, okay, this is kind of especially funny to say through a mask. Uh, AAA, there's kind of this AA and there's that AA, right? So maybe we should say there's two, but they do overlap. And what's the deal? Or suppose I look for, you know, um, BA, I, I don't know, B, BA. B B A B A, um, right? And I look for this isn't going to work that well. Um, okay, I was I was trying to come up with more creative examples than than all these, but these things do occur, right? Uh, where there's kind of uh, overlap between them, and you know, so BAB will be another one. I'm looking for BAB in this string. Here's here's one, and here's another one that's in it, right? Um, the string bab is in it twice, or is it in it once? So um, I would say probably you wanted to find it twice. You count it as being in it twice, but they're mutually exclusive in a way, right? Like if, if or you could say it's mutually exclusive. If you take this to be the bab, you can't use this as part of the bab. Okay, I don't know what the bab is, but uh, I can look it up. I guess. Um, okay. So, so that's a reasonable one. Anyone else have comments here? Why not? What else might you want to think about here? I've heard a lot of really good things. Well, there's the same thing. If it's language that has nulls, you might want to check it. If it's language that allows you to pass any old data, you know, as part of these, you want to make sure these are strings. The world is sane that you're not being passed counterfeit strings, right? Yeah, it's a good thing. Um, okay, any, any others on this? How about the third one? Extract substring. Okay, so this looks easy. You have a string, and then you have a start and an end. And this time I've actually provided some time so you can count on it not being any old types of power. Okay, so within this string, we want to extract the substring going from index start to index final. Okay. Um, what's, what might your specification involve? Yes, uh, Chanti. Uh, like, what do we mean by starting? Is it like we're counting it from zero or we're counting it from one? Aha. Aha. And I was hoping someone would notice that for the first of these. Even find first. Okay, so suppose we are finding. The string, you know, AA and this string AAA. Okay. Um, so should it return zero for the zero at that moment or should it return one? This is almost a fighting issue between computer science and math. I'll tell you. In, in math, the starting point is always one, like the starting index is one. Um, in computer science, it's almost always zero. And I cannot tell you the number of bugs that this has led to. Um, you, you see them, by my age, you see them just a lot, um, where you know you have, um, you have this confusion about whether it, it's zero for the first or one for the first. So even with the first of these, we 
So when we said find the location, we sort of said where zero indicates the first location, or alternatively, where one indicates the first location. You have to be careful about that because people who use our library could be from different backgrounds. If there are programmers, they may be very used to dealing with one being the first index, right? Um, yes. Um, okay. I'm not sure about this, but like since generally in computer science, it's general to use zero unless it's explicitly stated we don't use the zero at the beginning, everyone's supposed to use like zero index. Is that correct? Uh, if it's unwritten, in other words, if it's not stated, I would assume that that's the case. However, there's large numbers of computer scientists these days who work in machine learning using R as a programming language, and they're always dealing with one, and it's not stated in R code that it's one. It's just you kind of know if I'm dealing with R, it's one as the first element. And then there's languages like Julia, which have a huge math and stats following and computer science following. You've got to be careful. So. Uh, I'd say if it's not written in computer science oriented languages, yeah, that's probably a pretty good assumption. But, you know, this is about you writing specifications. And if you write specifications, it is advised at this point that you try to specify, you know, it's, it's zero based. It doesn't hurt to put in something for that as a reminder. But yes, in general, it is zero based. Um, it's just computer science and statistics and you know because of machine learning and AI they're kind of meshing and it can lead to a lot of confusions. Just like 1 billion means different things over in England than it does in North America. You want to be careful with use terms like that. Um, okay, but let's back go back to extract subscript. Okay, so you have this issue of whether it's zero based or one based. What else do you have here as an issue? Yes, Ram. Uh, Ram. Oh, Tati. Yes. Um, we can have like some kind of a specification for the default values. Okay. So that, like, in case like if the user is not passing start, okay. then the program will consider uh, the zero index at the start, or if they are not passing the final, then Okay, okay. So you have, like, the in okay, that's, so that will be a good to be. Yes, yeah, yeah, uh, excellent. Um, so this time it's right. Yeah, yeah. Also, like, um, the start and the final can't have, has to have the correct order. Like, the start can be after the final, and the final can be before the start. Exactly. So, start needs to be less than or equal to final, right? That would be really whacked out if final could be before start, right? Um, does that even make sense? Okay, well, speak on. What what other things might be kind of whacked out? Yes, Lee. If you have like um, negatives. If you have negative start or negative final, that what would the meaning of that be? Now, in some languages, that actually is defined. It's actually meaning it's like from the end of the string and stuff like that, but. But you want to be very clear about that when they call the code. Is that allowed or is it not allowed, right? You don't want it to leave it to second guessing. Why not leave it to second guessing? Why don't, why don't you leave it? Why not? Yes, Ren? I guess the person who's reading the code won't really know. Like, yeah, they won't know. They won't know what it does now. So suppose they test it with your code and it doesn't blow up. Give it negative values and it seems to return the right thing. What's the problem with them just counting on it? Because you might evolve your code, change your code, and it's not guaranteed. And they can't take it to the bank from now on. This is guaranteed. So their code might break subsequently. So you got to be really careful about what people should assume implicitly by just saying, oh, it works. Well, maybe it works right now, but maybe next week it won't work. Yes, Rick. Uh, also, like if the final is uh, longer than the length of the index, uh, the length of the string, sorry. Or length of string minus one, maybe. Yes, if it's greater than length of string minus one. Yeah. So yeah, you want to be want to be very careful. What are you know? And it's not just each can be specified independently. Just as Renton said, you've got this. This constraint where you know start less has to be less than or equal to final. I think it was someone said yeah. that. Yeah. 
Um, so there's actually these dependencies and these can't be greater than the length of the string. So you start to see when you write preconditions, um, you actually need to sometimes reference them to each other, right? Not just independently say string has to be non empty or, you know, start has to be greater than or equal to zero. That's all well and good, but there's often things about their relation to each other that are logical constraints. So why am I telling you all this? I'm telling you all this because you're going to be future software engineers whose code would be a lot better off if you include specifications, at least for many key routines. But I'm also telling you because in this class, these are considered very, very good practice. And if you can get them into your code, it will ease your testing. It will ease your modifiability. It will help people across your team understand what code does without realizing, without reading it. They can understand what they can count on from that code from now on. And all these sorts of benefits, writing assertions, et cetera. Writing specifications is best practice for code and it eases so many aspects of testability and evolution of the software. And that's, ladies and gentlemen, what I'm seeking from you today. Okay? Okay. So I promised you a bit of time at the end of class. And unfortunately, I've done a disservice to you with your.